Hello, all my beautiful Cinnabar moths or any kind of moth you'd like to be. Welcome to the Writer's Triangle, a podcast about publishing and all things books. And today we have a little bit of a heavy topic. And I want to talk about writing slurs because I think it's really important in this day and age to understand, one, what a slur is. Because I'll be very honest, the definition of what a slur is should never change. It should always be understood. But in my lifetime, I'm in my 50s, and in my lifetime, what a slur is has changed quite a bit. And so I'm I'm going to say a word that may be triggering for some people, and please forgive me, but the word bitch, for example. When I was growing up, bitch was not considered a slur, and it was something that could be used rather freely and said to anyone. It was also a term of endearment and closeness, and there were taking back the language movement and people were using that word and reclaiming the language. So there is a culture of taking a slur, whether it be a gender slur or an an identity slur of any kind, and using that within the targeted group as a term of endearment or empowerment. And for me, it's, it can be quite jarring and it can be done well and it can be done bad. But something to understand about slurs for me that I think is really important is that we understand that we are using a slur. So for me, a slur is anytime language is used to hurt based on identity. Anytime you take an aspect of a person's identity and make it have a negative connotation, that is a slur. And I'll use an example, one that isn't as charged, but should be. And it's the word ginger. And for me, having a lot of friends from the UK, I didn't understand that ginger could be used as a slur. And in my culture, it's just not used as a slur. And I didn't understand that. So understanding that language has cultural and regional specificity, and so do slurs. So some slurs and some language may land really heavy in one area and not at all in another. And so looking at the different racial slurs and the different use of language throughout the years, anytime you're using identity-specific language and you're using it in a neg- with a negative connotation, that's what makes it a slur. And I feel like that definition of what a slur is is really straightforward and easy to understand and at the level where everybody can access it. And for me, I'll be honest, the things that I was called as as a child in a derogatory way really, really affect me deeply when I read them. And the things I wasn't called as a child don't tend to affect me as much. And there are some things that people find really, really offensive and and really heavily charged now that don't affect me at all that have to do with my identity because I just don't. I think it was born after the slur may have been born after I went through puberty. And I, I kind of feel like after I went through puberty, what people could say to enter me became really limited. My personality just changed quite a bit during that process. And I became stronger in my own identity and my own strength and understanding who I was and what was beautiful about me and really getting to that place of acceptance. Even when you're in your strength and strongest moment of accepting yourself, a slur can come out of nowhere and really take you out of yourself and take you out of the moment and take you to a very bad place and take you to the sunken place. And it can happen just like that. And that's the same, I think, for everybody. And what slurs impact you that way and what slurs don't impact you that way is neither here nor there. As a writer, you need to understand the power of your words and the fact that as a writer, no matter what your identity is, once you step into the place of writer, you're in the place of power because you're making all of the decisions. So every writer is writing from a place of power. And that power comes from the fact that you're creating a world 
you're creating a story, you're creating characters, you're creating all of it. Even if it even if you're writing nonfiction, you're choosing what to show and what not to show. You're making all of the choices in that first draft of your writing. And then you have editors that come along and, and have their, their 50 cents and publishers and, and agents and all of those things that have their feedback and beta readers and such. So it's really important when you're writing that first draft that you understand that you're writing from a place of power because you are are making all of the choices to own that power, to fully step into that that power and acknowledge it and treat the writing with the level of respect that, that it deserves. There have been authors throughout the ages that have used slurs as a way to wake people up, have used slurs as a way to empower themselves as a writer, um, And if you look at some of the greats, you'll find that there are a lot of Black authors that use slurs against Black people, which are my people. And they do it from a place of anger, a place of wanting to reclaim their own power, and sometimes the place of wanting to slap someone hard across the face. And I feel like that's what a slur can do. It can turn your, your blood to ice. It can make your blood boil. It can be a slap across the face. It can be a lot of negative things. And for some people, it can be a place of, of comfort and celebration. The people who use slurs to harm, it can be a place of celebration. For me, as someone who purchased books that have slurs in them, I do not purchase books where they are written from the point of view of the person who uses the slur and revels in it. I never purchase a book that they're reveling in the use of a slur. And that's down to my personal preference and my personal boundaries. I just think that there's enough of that in the world and I don't need to be putting more of that in the world. So for me, if you're writing a slur and you're writing from the point of view of a person in power who is using slurs, is that slur absolutely necessary? Because I find that slurs can be used in a very sloppy way and that irritates me when it's just a shorthand to tell me that this is a bad guy, or if this is shorthand to sort of earmark the era of what it was, or to create ambiance. And no, it's just, it's not necessary. And for me, there have been great books that I start reading them, and they use a slur to sort of capture the sign of the times, as it were. A lot of people like to use slurs when writing it about the 70s, when I grew up. And I'll tell you, they weren't just being thrown around like that. And people weren't just using them without consequences. I think because there isn't any social media like there is now, that you're not seeing people have violent reactions to those slurs being used. But in the 70s, guarantee that if you called somebody a slur, they were most likely going to have a violent reaction. I think in the 60s, it was still a little bit dangerous to have that violent reaction but post 60s was sort of a a new era in that it was safer to have those those reactions it wasn't safe it's never safe to have a violent reaction so for me my lived experience in the 70s slurs were not just thrown around like that but what was considered a slur was different so what people called themselves was very different than what people call themselves today. So if it's a within group usage, it doesn't take me out of it. But if it's a without group usage and it it can be expressed in a different way, I would say go that different way and don't use the slur. If you're using a slur to convey that somebody is horrible, choose a different way. It's just, or if you're using a slur to show that somebody is passively accepting, of the the race or gender or identity dynamics that exist that are unequal, choose a different route. 
don't have a character that you want somebody to empathize with or like or dislike that you want somebody to have strong emotions, don't use slurs as a way to sort of cheat the curve and cheat the process of letting me get to know and decide for myself who I'm going to like and who I'm not going to like. And that's my main problem with slurs is that I think they feel really heavy handed and pointed and like the author is trying to force an emotional reaction or sort of my thinking or, or my connection. And I don't like that forced feeling. If a slur comes out of nowhere, I'm done. Whether it be a book or a movie or a song or a poem, as soon as I get a slur and it feels off to me, I'm out of there. So you, you run the risk of really losing your audience if they're not used authentically. And I think for people who don't use slurs and haven't been around people that use slurs, shouldn't write slurs because there's an inauthenticity to it because you don't know when it would be natural. And I use the same for, for cursing. If you don't curse and you're having your character use a lot of foul language, it's going to come off strange and there's going to be strange pairings. There's the sort of language of, of how curse words go together. And it's the same thing of when and how slurs occur. And people tend to mistakenly think that in everyday conversation, slurs just get thrown around. And I can tell you that that's not actually how it happens. It's more pointed than that. And they mean to use it. And I find that if you're looking to express bias and and bigotry there has to be an intelligence to it and there has to be an understanding of how do people who think this way talk and how do they talk when they're within their their inner circle and it's just like-minded individuals and how do they talk when they're talking to someone that they have a bias towards and when would they feel comfortable using a slur or derogatory language? And when would it be most authentic and most natural? And because slurs always do harm and always cause pain, is it really necessary? Because you're going to trigger your audience as soon as you use that slur. There's going to be a reaction. It's going to get noticed. You're going to get everyone's attention at the at that point in time in the story and does it have the payoff that you want it to have so i have a couple of of examples of conversations that i have with authors about slurs and one is our first book has a sexuality slur and i did not agree with it and i spoke with the author and the author said that that word was said by that person specifically to hurt and they had an intelligence about why they were using it, and their argument sounded authentic to me. I did not enjoy it. I wouldn't have left it in the book, but in talking with the author, I was like, okay, that really makes sense to me, and I can see your point of view, and it, it feels authentic, it feels informed, and it doesn't feel like the bigotry is coming from them. Um, and in our second book, there are derogatory, uh, sexuality derogatory statements, and it was done to highlight the, the inequality that bisexual and, and the bias that bisexuals face. They're sort of written off and not honored. It's not acknowledged that bisexuality is an authentic sexual preference and one that should be respected and honored and and viewed as being an honest sexual identification and sexual preference. And that point, once I read all the way through to the end, I saw, okay, we, we brought it around, but it was very jarring. And there was conversations about that. And the conversations were very intelligent, again, and very authentic. And then we had a book that we didn't publish in which the author was using slurs just to show that a character was a bad person. And I was just like, this, it, it wasn't authentic. It was really 
heavy handed and it felt like a shortcut. And I talked to the author and I said, hey, this feels like a shortcut to me. I feel like you're forcing a feeling like you're wanting me to be revolted by this character. And they were saying, yeah, well, everybody is they're revolting. And because they're revolting, this is the way that they would speak. And I was like, but this is an internal dialogue. And do you really think that someone's internal dialogue is this heavily laced with slurs? And I've gotten to know people who have a lot of biases, and I've spoken to them about uh, about their bias and what their internal dialogue is. And it's really not that pointed. It's really more offhanded. It's very much those people kind of kind of language. And it's really not it's not just a string of slurs. It's not just, there might be one or two peppered in there, but it's not, you know, 10 or 15 in like the space of a three minute thought unpack on a page. So there just really doesn't need, think like, do you need every single one that you're using? Can you make the point with less? And we did publish a book, Profits Debt specifically is really a heavy book and is heavily laced with a lot of slurs and a lot of really ugly language that does not happen when the characters are talking amongst themselves as much as when somebody who is an abuser and a horrible person and a predator is using it to hurt and maim, but the story is not told from that person's perspective. And I think it's really handled well with a lot of sensitivity and intelligence. And we get to go through the process of this person, just the main character discovering themselves, them being vilified for their identity, and then coming into their own. And so that journey makes sense. And some really horrible things happen in the middle of that process. When those horrible things are happening, I had to ask myself, like, are these things too horrible? Is it too much? Does it need to be reined in? And there were lots of really great conversations with with the author about, okay, this feels a little heavy. This makes sense. And in that conversation, as a writer, if you're talking with a press or an agent or an editor or a, a beta reader, sensitivity reader, about what you're writing, listen to what they have to say with an openness of spirit and ask them questions. Why do you think this? And ask, get a second opinion by all means, but be open to it. And if you're getting that, that feedback from more than one person, my advice would be scale it back. Scale it back for readability. Because at the end of the day, we want as many people as possible reading your book, right? And you want great reviews. So I'm not saying that, that slurs can't be used. I'm saying there has to be a reason and because for me, you're going to be hurting your audience, even if you use it in a, as a form of intimacy or as a form of, you know, the way two friends speak to each other, there are going to be people that are hurt by the use of that language. So are you hurting people just to hurt them or does it actually move the story, the story forward or take it in a direction where you're having the type of conversation you want to have or you're hoping to evoke. So really understanding what is the purpose is paramount. I know there are going to be some people that are going to have examples of this book or that book where they do it and the book may be a bestseller. And I say to you, I am one person in the whole of of the world reading. I'm only one person, but I'm one person with the ability to publish books. And every person has the ability to publish, publish books, but I also have the motivation and drive to do so. So this is really looking at a publisher's perspective, because at the end of the day, we have to market and sell your book and look at the date those books were published and the date that those books became bestsellers and look at who was able to write those books when. Because I'm telling you now, who you are as an author really shapes who as a press, and I talk with, with other press owners about this and we're all in agreement 
with this and even the big the big four these three big five now have the perspective that who's writing it matters are you allowed to write this way and i think that there does need to be a little bit of that a little bit of considering who you are in terms of your identity what name is going on the cover of the book and when people look you up what are they going to think of you when they read it and if you are not from the group that you are writing about if you're not from the group that has been injured by that language and you're using it if it doesn't really fit and have a really solid purpose it's going to really ring false and it's going to put people off and it may put people off on you as an author and I love authors and I don't want authors to miss opportunities and I I don't want authors to be disliked or, or viewed negatively because they were writing with good intentions and they were writing with a, a good purpose but they just overuse slurs a little bit too much or use slurs that really weren't necessary and the book could have done without and there are times that that authors will include will drop a slur here or there and we just edit that that out completely just nope it doesn't fit and there's no conversation we just strike it from the book and what we do in our editing process is after the editor goes through it all of those strikes are there but we don't put a comment next to them but we do give the author the opportunity to put a comment next to any edit and send it back to us. And sometimes there's a conversation afterwards and, and sometimes there's just agreement. But there there is always the awareness that at the end of the day, we're trying to make your book as marketable as possible. And that's what these podcast episodes are about. It's about improving the marketability of your book. Because when you hear the statistics, they're just heart-wrenching. When you're here like Penguin, their average book is selling 12 copies in its lifetime. That's crazy, right? That's wild. I'm sorry for my use of, of crazy. I'm trying to switch to wild because, and that's a perf this is a perfect example of catching yourself using language that's outdated. And as a writer, I say, write your first draft and just be authentically yourself. Like, I'm authentically myself. I'm not going to edit that out. I'm going to leave it in. And I'm sorry for anyone that that hurts. And I'm sorry that I haven't fully converted my, my language to use the word wild in place of that. Because when I was, when I was growing up, that was the word we used with a lot of, a lot of other words that I've been quicker to edit out of my vocabulary that one is is sticking a little bit and I'm doing my own good work with myself to say why is this one sticking and I think because I really I don't see it as a slur until I stop and think about it right and there's going to be words like that that we don't see them as slurs until we stop and think about it and what is that word meant to express I meant to express it's wild, it's, it's out of the ordinary, but because it has a negative connotation and it's been used to hurt people, I have to edit that out. So I'm showing a real time an example of, of what it looks like to edit your language and to be inclusive. And that's my goal as a, a publisher and an owner of a press is to be inclusive in the authors that we include and the point of views that we include and the type of readers that we attract. We want to be inclusive and inviting and welcoming and safe. But the book market is flooded and make no mistake about it. When you look at the numbers, they're wild and it's a dog eat dog world out there. And Thankfully, our books are doing better than, than Penguin's doing. Jeez Louise, I feel bad for them. I feel like maybe they should cut back on how many books they're putting out because you have to just not be doing any marketing at all to have numbers that bad is what I'm thinking. I don't know. It came out in the, the lawsuit, so it's, it's on my mind because we've been digesting it. And it's sort of like what everybody's talking about right now because so much information came out and it's weird that you get that kind of raw data dump of, you know, a big press's numbers, and it was just really quite shocking. So yeah, but most people are doing about that, to be honest, when you look at, you know, how many books will sell over 100 or over 
200 in their lifetime and you're down to, I think, like 10% of, of millions of books, you're down to a handful of folks. So don't do anything that's going to give the reader permission to put your book down and not pick it up again. Don't give the your audience anything that's going to give them permission to not read your next book or your back catalog, because that's where authors make their money is the sales of their back catalog. It's not usually, it's not any one particular book. It's the totality of, of all the books that they've written and, and the residuals on that. So when you're looking at slurs and, and using them, be thoughtful, be mindful, be purposeful, and ask yourself, am I giving the audience an excuse to close my book? Is it necessary? What is the purpose of this? And does this serve me? And does this represent me in a way that I want to be represented and in the way that I want my audience to get to know me as an author? Is this what I want to stand by? Is this what I want to put more of in the world? And hey, remember, I've got books out there. We've got the press has books out there with stores in them. So I'm not coming from a holier than thou place. I'm just, you know, a word of caution, you know, less is more and be purposeful. There's a the the two takeaways from this episode I hope everyone has and yeah I hope writers write we need more good stories so I want to thank all my beautiful Cinnabar moths for listening you can be any kind of moth you want to be or you can even be a butterfly but I'm not Mariah Carey and I'm not trying to bite her rhyme bye